Okay, uh, of the six addresses I am giving, I think this is probably the most difficult one. <coughs> so I'm reminded of a phrase that Milton uses in the invocation to book seven of Paradise Lost. Fit audience, though few. Or maybe it's in the invocation of book nine. Fit audience, though few. Uh, it's Milton's acknowledgement that he's writing in a difficult form, epic, and uh, puts a lot of, the poem he wrote puts a lot of demands on his reader, but he's um, optimistic nonetheless, but he's got a really good group, so I'm optimistic as I look at you. You're the creme de la creme at this conference, that is pretty obvious. All right, teaching a Christianized classical text, Milton's Paradise Lost. Again, I need to make sure that we're on the same page regarding the word classical in my title. This time, classical means that which comes from ancient Greek and Roman cultures. Attempts by Christian thinkers and writers to retain what was Christian in the classical tradition and reform what was not occupied them right through the Renaissance. I would say John Milton was a major player in this chapter of the intellectual history of the West. In my courses in which Paradise Lost is the last major work that we read, my final assignment consists of students writing on the very subject of this address that I'm about to deliver. I ask my students to explore how Milton's Christian faith led him to make modifications in the classical epi epic tradition and of the particular type that we find in Paradise Lost. As that, suggest, that assignment suggests a particular interest of mine and even area of specialty is the ways in which Paradise Lost deviates from classical epic. It has become a critical commonplace that Paradise Lost is both epic and counter-epic or even anti-epic. I am very much of that persuasion, and the subject will occupy most of what I do in this address. Lest I overshoot the mark on the side of how Milton revamped the epic tradition, and ignore the ways in which Paradise Lost needed to be an epic before it could be an anti-epic, let me take time to list the most obvious ways in which Paradise Lost is an epic in the classical mold. Here's a list of tra epic traits of Paradise Lost. Invocations to deity in which the poet prays for guidance in composing his poem. An opening announcement of epic theme or subject. Beginning in medias res and then inserting a large-scale flashback in the middle of the story. A hero of national or world importance. As an extension of that, the motif of heroism along the lines of Northrop Frye's comment that being an epic, Paradise Lost has to deal with the traditional theme of the epic, which is the theme of heroic action. Epic is always a comment on the ultimately heroic action that a person can undertake. The martial theme, by which I chiefly mean battlefield action. Supernatural machinery, or inclusion of supernatural agents. A vision of future history. A central epic feat around which the entire story is constructed. Division into books. Inclusion of a complete cosmology. A pastoral interlude in the middle of the story. Presence of the high style, including frequent use of epic similes and epithets. A motif of kingdom or empire. References to previous epics, including mythological references. Divine councils, where members of deity determine what to do in regard to events on earth. I will note two things in passing about the list I just gave you. One is that, as I discovered when writing my reader's guide on Paradise Lost, almost everything in Milton is bigger and better than in his epic predecessors. Secondly, Milton adapted all of the epic conventions to a Christian worldview. For example, the invocations to the muse in Homer and Virgil are a tip of the hat and are over almost as quickly as they begin. Milton's four epic invocations are major passages. In fact, books as well as essays have been written on them. Moreover, Milton obviously invokes the God of the Bible. He names attributes that belong to the Christian God, thereby making his invocations Christian statements. He loads his invocations with biblical allusions. 
he invokes a god who actually hates him as he composes. Again, every epic poet chooses a story from existing mythology or supernatural narrative that is believed to be historically true and religiously authoritative. Homer and Virgil went to the Trojan War, which was the central myth of their cultures. Milton, as Christian, takes his story material from the Bible. His very choice of subject matter is a Christianizing of classic. <coughs> Epics incorporate what literary critics call supernatural machinery. For Homer, this was the gods and goddesses and monsters and superheroes of classical mythology. For Milton, it is the Christian supernatural, God, angels, Satan, demons. The descent to the underworld is an epic convention. In Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus visits Hades, and Hades turns out to be the afterlife of people who lived on Earth. In Book One of Paradise Lost, the journey to the underworld is a full-scale portrayal of Satan, hell, and demonic evil. A final example, epics include multiple councils of the gods. In classical epic, these are brief meetings. In the classroom, I facetiously call them faculty meetings of the gods, <laughs> in which uh, the, the uh, gods and goddesses talk about events on Earth. Milton's epic council, the so-called Dialogue in Heaven in Book Three, runs true to form in the sense that the father and son discuss what to do on Earth in view of Adam and Eve's impending disobedience. What is distinctly Christian is the content of the dialogue which covers the essentials of Christian theology. In class, I say, Milton turned his dialogue into heaven into a crash course of theology. He covers the sinfulness of people, the sovereignty of God, the justice and mercy of God, the atonement of Jesus, and redemption through that substitutionary atonement. All right, that's preview. I'm ready to turn to my main topic. Milton had aspired to write an epic starting at least as far back as the age of 20. So let me take time to trace Milton's evolving plans to write the great English epic and the great Christian epic. We first hear about Milton's aspiration to write an epic poem when he was a 20-year-old student at Cambridge University. In a piece written for a school program entitled At a Vacation Exercise, Milton expressed an ambition to use the English language to write a poem comparable to the Iliad and the Odyssey. And as he briefly describes it, it's obvious that he's going to write about classical mythology. A year later, Milton committed himself to the life of austerity that would be required to write an epic, and now Virgil seems to have been Milton's model. Eleven years later, at the age of 32, Milton had changed his game plan and expressed an intention to write an epic of nationalistic interest that would take its material from Arthurian romance. Two years later, in a prose pamphlet entitled The Reason of Church Government, Milton was undecided as to the subject matter for his magnus opus. But the really crucial element in his thinking at this point was that the hero of his story needed to be, quote, the pattern of a Christian hero. The pattern of a Christian hero. I would just say epic is a genre in quest for a hero. The epic poet is looking for a hero who will embody what is ultimately important to him and his culture. And epic is a genre in quest for the right vision of what constitutes heroic action. Heroic action. By the time Milton began to compose his epic, he had decided on early Genesis as the story material. <coughs> in Milton's shifting plans, we can see that the choice of epic subject was something of a problem. The nature of that problem will be clarified if we place Milton's dilemma regarding choice of epic subject into a broader context. John Stedman offers this summary of what had preceded Milton's thoughts on what to choose as story material for his epic. I quote, classical and Christian ethics had presented heroic virtue, virtue rationally and abstractly as a general idea. Epic poetry had depicted it sensuously and concretely in images of particular heroes. Milton inherited both approaches to the hero. So Stedman speaks of an ethical tradition, including the theological and a literary tradition. Furthermore, Stedman argues, there was a striking inconsistency or discrepancy between the two definitions of the hero, the ethical and the literary. I quote, not only did the poetic conception of heroism fall notably short of the ethical norm, for the most part, it contradicted the latter, entirely. 
What does Stedman mean when he claims that the poetic tradition was at odds with the moral tradition? Pinthover and Virgil tell stories about noble heroes with admirable qualities. My answer is not in any absolute sense. And in writing what Milton himself called a poem doctrinal and exemplary to a nation, Milton was committed to telling a story that embodied absolute values and ultimate virtues, not just secondary ones. Western epic and romance give us variations on a single theme, the warrior whose essential feat is military conquest and whose goal is earthly success. The hero in this tradition based his life on what today we call the success ethic, the belief that what is most worth having in life is earthly wealth, power, fame, and in the romance tradition, sexual gratification. Above all, the literary tradition was humanistic in its outlook. The archetypal gestures of the hero in this tradition were boasting, bloodshed, and reliance on physical strength. But for the moral, and especially the Christian tradition, the hero was not the warrior, but the saint. The saint of Christian ethics and spirituality is at odds with the heroic image of Western epic at virtually every turn. <clears throat> The greatest saint is the servant of all. Instead of winning honor and a kingdom for himself, the saint is the suffering servant who works redemptively for others. The ultimate rewards of heroic endeavor are not an earthly kingdom, but spiritual union with God and eternal life in heaven. The saint's archetypal gestures are obedience, repentance, prayer, and reliance on God, not busting on bloodshed and reliance on self. The problem of reconciling these two images of the hero had exercised Christian poets from the Middle Ages on. Attempted solutions included the Holy War motif, as in the Song of Roland, and the allegorical solution, as in Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. Milton did not duplicate the unsuccessful attempts of his predecessors, but did something far more radical. He brought his literary image of the hero in line with the religious and moral image of the hero. Before I look at that subject in detail, I want to take time to explore the ways in which Milton gave his readers some very helpful signposts right in the text of Paradise Lost in regard to his game plan for revamping the classical epic genre in such a way as to make it Christian. Two of the most obvious passages are the invocation to book one and the invocation to book nine so I want to take time to look at Milton's game plan for Christianizing the epic tradition as laid out in this invocation. So first, the uh, invocation of Book One on the back side of the hand. I'll just read the whole thing and then generalize. <clears throat> of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, Till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seed, sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Sion Hill delight thee more and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest. Thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sets brooding on the vast abyss that makes it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Milton begins his epic by reenacting important epic rituals. And let me say in passing that when I teach Paradise Lost, I belabor the point that epic is the most formal and exalted genre of literature, and therefore also the most laden with ritual. I speak continuously of Milton's reenacting this or that epic ritual. Paradise Lost opens with the ritual of the poets announcing his epic theme or subject of man's first disobedience. Even to begin with a prepositional phrase is to reenact an epic ritual. 
I believe that Milton is echoing the opening of the Aeneid. Of arms and the man I sing. Also the opening of Homer's Odyssey, where most English translations give us the prepositional phrase of the man in their rendition of the opening line, as for example, of the man who is never at a loss. The opening phrase of Paradise Lost shows indebtedness to the epic tradition of man's first disobedience, but it also signals that Milton is writing an anti-epic in which Christianity subverts classicism. Here is John Stedman on the subject. The uniqueness of Paradise Lost is implicit in the first enunciation of its theme, man's first disobedience. Unlike the usual heroic poem, it does not propose a victory, but a defeat. Its action is not some illustrious act of benefit, but a crime. Its hero is not a paragon of virtue, but the archetypal sinner. The results of this conflict are not glory, but shame, not dominion or deliverance, but servitude and death. Instead of celebrating his merit, the poem chastises his vice. As I tell my students, John has gotten his epic subject all wrong, given the previous epic tradition. Hugh Richmond, in his book entitled The Christian Revolutionary, calls Paradise Lost the anatomy of failure. There are other ways in which the opening invocation represents a Christianizing and revamping of the epic genre that Milton inherited. Suzanne Langer long ago observed helpfully that epic is the great vehicle of myth. Obviously, Milton has replaced classical mythology with the story material of the Bible. Milton does not invoke the classical muses, but the heavenly muses, that is God. Milton invokes God in three different forms. As the God who inspired Moses, as the God who speaks his word for Mount Zion, and as the spirit who created the world. Milton's meta-narrative is not the story of the Trojan War, but as stated in lines four, the story of redemption in Christ. And then there are the provocative lines 12 through 16. I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. When Milton says that he plans to soar above the Aeonian Mount, that is Mount Helicon, he is announcing that he plans to surpass the classical epic tradition. This is an important point. For Milton as Christian writer, the classical epic tradition is not only a model to be imitated, but a rival to be surpassed, and I would dare to say even refuted. And as for claiming to be doing something unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, I believe that this primarily means that Milton was the first writer to take Christian story material and a Christian worldview and package them in a poem that has all the formal traits of classical epic. No one had yet done that. I will note in passing that one of the obvious adaptations that Milton made was to replace the hazy and frivolous cosmology of classical mythology with the cosmology of the Bible, including its premise of a three-tiered universe comprised of heaven, earth, that's the invocation of book one. There are a lot of signals being sent to us. Milton is doing something revolutionary with the epic. Uh, secondly, the invocation to book nine. I'm gonna work my way through it piecemeal, reading a unit and then commenting on how it fits into my thesis. Um, Milton uses his four epic invocations partly to signal a narrative transition. The first one gets the whole show underway. And then after that, we move from what has just preceded to the next. Already, all right, at the beginning of Book Nine, Milton wants to signal he's finished with his portrayal of life in paradise, including a visit from the angelic uh, messenger Raphael, who had, as the dialogue ensued, given full scale accounts of a war in heaven and the creation of the earth. So that's what the opening reference here is. Milton next has to turn to the story of the fall. So Milton begins his invocation by awakening our nostalgia for the paradisal scenes in which he has portrayed, that he has portrayed in the middle of the poem. And it's very abrupt. This is not the poet with his singing robes on. No more of talk where God or angel guest with man as with his friend, familiar used to sit indulgent, and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the wild venial discourse unblamed. That's just a very um, high style version of saying, I'm finished with that part of the epic in which Raphael just sat around after supper and discussed things with Adam and Eve. 
Next, Milton creates an unpleasant sensation about what he now has to turn to. Notice the unpleasant S sounds. I now must change those notes to tragic, foul distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man, revolt and disobedience. On the part of heaven now alienated distance and distaste anger and just rebuke and judgment given that brought into this world a world of woe, sin and her shadow, death and misery, death's harbinger. Okay, that's narrative transition. Uh, having talked about his epic progress, Milton next turns to his epic subject. Here's where he hints at the anti-epic nature of his material. Sad task. Yet argument, subject matter, not less, but more heroic. All right, let me just tease you with the thought. How can the story of the fall of the human race be more heroic than winning the Trojan War? Not some uh, argument not less, <coughs> but more heroic than the wrath of stirring Achilles on his foe pursued thrice fugitive about Troy Wall, or rage of Turnus for Lavinia disespoused, or Neptune's ire, that's Poseidon in the Odyssey, or Juno's that so long perplexed the Greek and Soteria's son, all right, Milton here denounces classical epic, singling out Virgil and Homer for invidious comparison. I mean, that's pretty dangerous, I would think. <clears throat> All right, classical epic is less heroic than the story of the fall. Well, how so? Well, I think one possibility is, maybe among others, it's less heroic in not being morally and spiritually exemplary, less worthy as a, a model for human endeavor. I want to pause to toss in two other things. Uh, Milton never calls Paradise Lost an epic poem. He always refers to it as a heroic poem. So be alert to that as we continue working. Not less, but more heroic. Okay. Well, that means that he's writing a genre in which the really crucial thing is to find the right hero to embody the right worldview. Okay. Heroic poem. Uh, secondly, I want to again put on the table uh, a phrase from Milton's prose, he aspired to write, quote, a poem doctrinal and exemplary to a nation. Doctrinal. Embodying not just ideas, but the ultimately important ideas. <clears throat> ideas about right and wrong, what matters most. Doctrinal. Exemplary, well, embodying a model of good human behavior, I would say, and, and a picture of the good life. Okay. Sad task to write about the story of the fall, yet yeah, more heroic the Aeneid and the Odyssey. Uh, having talked about his epic progress on subject, Milton turns next in lines 20 to 24 to his epic inspiration. That's not a main concern, so I'll just read the lines. If answerable style I can uh, obtain of my celestial patroness, who deigns her nightly visitations unimplored and dictates to me slumbering, or inspires easy my unpremeditated verse, uh, Milton composing Paradise Lost in his blindness typically would have 20 or 30 lines composed in the morning and his amanuensis would come in and write them down. Now back to the really crucial subject for my address. What constitutes the right epic subject? Milton announces a revolution, beginning at line 25. He objects to the earlier epic and romance traditions, and that had encompassed pretty much all of serious narrative to this point for the West. Uh, Milton voices three objections to it. The main one is ethical and an objection to worldview, values, and virtues. He conducts side skirmishes on the boring nature of battlefield action and um, the fact that these stories were not historically true. So, but mainly it is the objection is ethical and thematic. Since first, this subject, early Genesis, for heroic song pleased me, long choosing, well I've traced that with you, and beginning late, age 50, not sedulous by nature to write about wars, hitherto the only argument heroic deemed, chief mastery to dissect with long and tedious havoc. I agree. I think all that battlefield action in Homer and Virgil gets very tedious. You are entitled to your taste in that. Long and tedious havoc. Um, Fabled knights in battles fame. That's another side skirmish, fabled and fame. Everyone agreed that uh, Epic had to deal with events that really happened. <clears throat> By the time Milton wrote in the 17th century, only one repository of 
supernatural narrative that was historically true remained. Classical mythology was a literary phenomenon, not a religious belief system, the Bible. So a little side skirmish, well, the stories of Arthur and his romance, and Arthurian, Arthurian romances, fictional, not true. But now back to the really important thing, the ethical and thematic concern. The better fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom on some. To be a martyr is the opposite of winning on the battlefield, I will say in passing. Uh, then for several lines, Milton uh, gets back to his boring story material, and he particularly is talking about Arthurian romance. I don't even know exactly what he's describing in these things, but it's, it's the uh, romance material. So I pick it up at line 40. He's not going to write about that. That's not the thing that justly gives heroic name to person or to poem. He's in a quest for the right hero. Me of these, nor skilled nor studious, he's not going to imitate all that. Higher argument remains sufficient of itself to raise that name, meaning heroic. Milton's very subject matter, he says, is heroic. Well, how can a story about human failing be higher, quote unquote, than a story about human greatness? I am reminded of a comment that a Britisher made, Lord David Cecil, when he wrote, Christianity has compelled the mind of people, not because it is the most cheering view of human existence, but because it is truest to the past. In any case, with this invocation, Milton compels us to think about his story not only as epic, but also as anti-epic. So let me conduct an analysis of how Milton Christianized the classical epic tradition so completely that we can accurately speak of Paradise Lost as an anti-epic as well as an epic. At the broadest level of formulation, and now you want to turn the hand up back to the other side. <clears throat> At the broadest level of formulation, Milton did two things. He replaced heroic values, that is, military values, with pastoral and domestic values. I'll elaborate that. Secondly, he replaced the warrior as hero with the Christian saint as hero. By making the garden of the pastoral tradition the central scene of his story, instead of the battlefield, Milton was able to offer as a picture of heroic virtue the life of Adam and Eve living in contentment, harmony with nature and each other, and moral innocence. By choosing the domestic life, I'll just say in passing, it's, it's customary to refer to Paradise Lost as a domestic epic. I also call Homer's Odyssey a domestic epic. Hmm. Uh, by choosing the domestic life of husband and wife rather than the military and political life of warriors and rulers, Milton was able to embody a whole range of spiritual virtues and values, such as married love, work, leisure, worship. I would say the whole range of activities that occupy a Christian family, values for which the battlefield provides little scope. Milton's anti-epic strategy, though, is more complex than just those two formulas, though they would work well in the classroom, if that's what your class is up for. But let me proceed to a more complex framework for seeing what Milton did, and I've arranged the material into four headings as on the chart. First, Milton took some conventional epic formulas and instead of celebrating them, condemned them by associating them with Satan and his fallen angels. These formulas include military prowess, the warrior's pride and selfish ambition, the quest for power and glory. Milton even reserves his heroic idiom or heroic style replete with long epic similes, mythological allusions, etc. He reserves his heroic idiom for context of evil and paradise lost. Two, Milton took some epic uh, conventional formulas and spiritualized what had previously been conceived as physical or earthly. These motifs include conquest, dominion, deliverance or rescue, battle or warfare, and heroism. In Paradise Lost, for example, warfare is spiritual, <coughs> obedience versus disobedience to God, not secular, earthly, and political. Conquest is not national and military, but is pictured rather by Adam and Eve's repentance from sin and faith in Christ, conquest of sin and death. The decisive conflict does not occur on the battlefield, as ancient epic would have it, but within the soul of Adam and Eve, and it is a spiritual conflict between good and evil. 
Deliverance in Paradise Lost is not physical or military, but is the spiritual deliverance that Christ promises to Adam and Eve and the liberation of the soul from sin and death through faith in Christ. And most obviously, heroism is not military, but spiritual. I'll elaborate on that. Uh, thirdly, Milton changed the focus of some epic formulas from the human to the divine. And this is especially true of his epic hero. For ep past epic poets praised a human hero or maybe a patron, Milton reserves his praise for God. Earlier epics praised the self-reliant human hero, I would be willing to argue. Milton praises the only self-reliant hero, <coughs> God. Uh, in Paradise Lost, conquest is not a human hero's victory, but Christ's defeat of Satan and his redemption of his churches in the dialogue in heaven in book three. And I've already noted that the warfare is not human and earthly, but angelic and heavenly and paradise lost. Uh, and fourthly, Milton took a pessimistic rather than an optimistic attitude toward human heroism. Instead of praising human goodness, Milton's very story exposes human weakness. For the vision of the future occupying two books in Paradise Lost way at the end, is not a celebration of national greatness as in the Aeneid and in the Fairy Queen, but it's an exposure of human waywardness, the vision of the future. So a good uh, summary statement by John Steadman, the old heroic patterns serve as foils, contrasts for the new. Uh, what does it all add up to? Well, John Steadman has a really nice <coughs> appreciative comment. He has written, a whole book and multiple very important essays on the subject. He became an expert in Paradise Lost as anti epic Well, he begins his final chapter of, the, of his book with this nice paragraph. Milton found the heroic poem brick and left it marble. For the praise of men, he substituted the glory of God. Instead of human strength, he depicted human frailty, accentuating this contrast by juxtaposing divine and human virtues. Instead of the physical warfare of secular politics, polities, he described the moral conflict of spiritual societies. Instead of celebrating heroic exploits, exploits he stressed their imperfections. In the, end of quotation. In the 20th century, we have become accustomed to the notion of anti-hero and anti-novel. Echoing one of my sources, it is now at last obvious what Paradise Lost is. It is the anti-epic. In, in the words of Stedman, Milton's poem is unlike all that had preceded it. Paradise Lost is to the tradition of heroic poetry what the anti-novel is to the conventional novel. It overthrows and displaces its predecessors, I'm quoting. Undermining the established epic tradition by destroying its ethical foundations, Paradise Lost is at once both epic and counter-epic. If it imitates the established models of heroic poetry, it also refutes them. In its own way, it achieves an intellectual revolution no less extraordinary than those of Copernicus and Kant, end of quotation. Uh, I will just observe in passing that epic, a poem that sums up what a whole culture wants to say, uh, is a very important ingredient in the intellectual history of the West. And I've even seen chapters devoted to the epic in intellectual histories of the West. So it's, it's very important to the cultures producing epics. Someone else writes, and one wishes that he or she could have been this clever. Paradise Lost closed the history of the epic genre in England. It closed the history of the epic, for you will not expect me to comment on the unspeakable labors of Blakemore, Glover, and Welkie. Fifth right, epic poets who succeeded Milton. Never was the death of an art form celebrated with such a magnanimous ceremony, the context being Milton wrote the last major epic the death of tragedy in the 20th century has been a mere decline into a whine and a whisper. But the death of epic was, in Milton's hands, a glorious and perfectly staged suicide. <laughs> now, the revamping of notions of epic heroism is related to the gender question. And here is Diane McCauley writing on Milton and the Sexes in the Cambridge Companion to Milton. Um, the poem as a whole gives at least as much praise to qualities often considered feminine as to those considered masculine, in quotation mark. Milton's major poems cast a great deal of scorn on the traditional epic hero's self-assertiveness and will to power, represented by Satan and his fellow vandals and terrorists. 
And they commend as more heroic the, quote, feminine virtues of gentleness, patience, humility, mercy, and devotion. Quoting, by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting world is grown, and worldly wise, by simply meek. I'll read the passage in a moment. Milton satirizes showy competition and violent displays of strength, ridicules the male notion that one can pursue fame and glory by flinging hardware and maiming flesh, and makes, as Genesis does, the nurturing, quote, woman's work of dressing and keeping the garden, together with increasing and multiplying, the shared and dignified concern of both sexes. The health and beauty of the earth and the growth of souls become in paradise lost clearly worthier effort and acquisition and exploitation. Summary statement, the imagery of paradise lost gives at least equal and sometimes superior value to constructs of the feminine. How does the anti-epic framework enter my in-class explication of Paradise Lost? I plant the seed early, in fact, when I explicate the opening invocation. After that, I point out ways in which many individual passages represent an epic motif, but with the meaning drastically altered when compared to classical epics. For example, with book one, I make sure that my students see how self-consciously Milton models Satan and the fallen angels on the old epic warriors but with inverted effect. I quote the following from C.M. Bauer's book, From Virgil to Milton. Epics display what is commonly and rightly called a heroic spirit and come from societies which hold heroic standards of conduct. This heroic world was a military world. The highest value was fame won through victory and physical warfare. The motivation was personal pride. The heroic world holds nothing so important as the prowess and fame of the individual hero skipping a little, heroism was the established subject of epic poetry. When Milton decided to write a heroic epic in the traditional manner, with a new purpose, he could hardly avoid altogether the old type of hero. It was part of the tradition and could not well be excluded. In Satan, Milton displays various qualities that belong to the old type and so forth. Uh, the, um, now, when I get to book four, devoted to Adam and Eve's life in paradise, I repeatedly observe that Milton as epic poet is given as images of heroic virtue as epic always does. Here too, I observe how Christianized these pictures of virtue are. When I teach books five and six devoted to the war in heaven, I observe that Milton often gives us an innovative twist to old epic motifs, and that often these represent a Christianizing of classical epic. However, even though I plant the seeds early, I do not formally introduce the concept of Paradise Lost as anti-epic until I come to the invocation of Book 9. I then devote at least half of the class session to covering what I have included in this address. In fact, I rated my class presentation for some of the material in this address. The effect of introducing the anti-epic material relatively late in my progress through Paradise Lost is that A, it casts a retrospective look back over the story as already covered, B, it thereby gives some concreteness to the generalizations that I make. And C, it provides a framework within which to assess classical epics read earlier in the course, thereby becoming an exercise in integration. I ease my way into the anti-epic presentation by the exercise that I put at the bottom of your handout. And as I, I distribute that, and then I say now, just to get us thinking in the right direction. Let's conduct this brief exercise. So it is as follows. I compare traditional epic and paradise lost in regard to selected major motifs. Uh, in traditional epic, the protagonist is the triumphant warrior as hero. In paradise lost, it's the archetypal sinner. Uh, the conventional epic subject is human success and glory. The subject of paradise lost is human failure. And then I pause on those first two and I ask, what's going on here? And my answer is, it's a vote of no confidence for the optimism of humanism. <laughs> a vote of no confidence for the optimism of humanism. Uh, the epic feat in traditional epic is winning a battle. Now, ordinarily, therefore, the epic feat embodies the epic norm of the epic, the highest ideal. The epic feat, the central event around which everything is constructed in Paradise Lost is, falling from innocence, mm. but not the epic norm, but it's the central event. Uh, the epic setting in Homer and Virgil is the battlefield. 
And uh, the setting for the action, it, when I toss it out for discussion, my students almost immediately say the garden, and that's not incorrect. But it's even more internalized than that. The ultimate setting for action in Paradise Lost is the individual human soul. Uh, the epic conflict in Homer and Virgil is military, and Arthurian romance. In Paradise Lost, the epic conflict is spiritual. Um, when I talk about Paradise Lost as anti-epic, I need to make sure that I do not over